Uh, Richard III is one of the few kings in English history who has dominated national television in the 21st century. He reigned for a little over two years, a very forgettable monarch, if not for his body being discovered below a car park in Leicester in 2012. Richard was crowned during the political quagmire that was the War of the Roses, a series of civil wars across England between the House of Lancaster, the Red Rose, and the House of York, the White Rose. His death concluded the war, making him the last Plantagenet king. Richard was a ruthless ruler, usurping the throne from his 13-year-old nephew, King Edward V of England, and is speculated to have had him killed along with his brother Richard to solidify his power. Hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Josh of Nerd and Dragon, and today we are taking a deep dive into King Richard III. Formative years Richard was born on the 2nd of October 1452 at Fotheringhay Castle in Northamptonshire, the fourth son of Richard III Duke of York, who, for this video, to avoid confusion, we will refer to simply as York, and his Duchess, Cecily Neville. His father was considered one of the most powerful nobles in the kingdom, with royal lineage, whilst his mother came from the most prolific, most politically prominent and best married of contemporary noble house. The young Richard was considered well-born and well-connected, even if, as the fourth son, his future was considered unpromising. His brothers each held their own prominent positions of power. Edward, the third Earl of March, Edmund, the Earl of Rutland, and George, the first Earl of Clarence. In fact, Richard's prospect looked that dismal that a verse genealogy of the family merely recorded that he liveth yet. Richard's young life was dominated by unrest. During his formative years, Richard's father initiated the early stages of the War of the Roses. This stemmed from York believing that the King Henry VI was a weak ruler and mentally infirm. In fact, the Duke of York had been appointed law protector of the kingdom previously due to Henry VI's ill health. Sensing an opportunity to secure power and ascend to the throne, the Duke of York captured King Henry VI at the First Battle of St Albans on the 22nd of May 1455. At this time, Richard was only two years old. Upon capturing the king, York was once again named law protector of the realm. However, King Henry would make a miraculous recovery from his mental infirmity and once again begin to rule. There is a whole host of information we could cover for this time period, but we will explore the detailed events of the War of the Roses in another video. Eventually, York began securing the support of nobles for his claim to the throne, and Henry and his wife Margaret of Anjou fled London for the Lancastrian-held Harlech Castle. During this period, Margaret negotiated with Scotland to support the Lancastrian army, which eventually marched on Sandal Castle and defeated Richard's father at the Battle of Wakefield. Both his father and brother Edmund were slain at this battle. Upon the conclusion of the battle and the deaths of the family, at eight years old, Richard and his older brother George escaped to the Low Countries, which are the modern day Netherlands and Belgium. They returned to England a year later following the defeat of the Lancastrians at the Battle of Towton, led by the older brother, Edward. Shortly after this, his brother would be crowned King Edward IV of England. Upon Edward IV's succession to the throne, England experienced a period of relative peace. During this time, Richard was made a royal prince. He was quickly created Duke of Gloucester and a Knight of the Most Noble Order of the Garter and Knight of Bath. During 1465, Richard was placed in the household of his cousin, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, better known as the Kingmaker. He was recorded with him at Warwick and York. It was probably late in 1468, when he was 16 years old, that Richard was declared of age, took possession of estates conferred to him by his brother, and commenced public life, attending court and judicial commissions. Rule of Edward IV the War of the Roses resumed in 1469 when the Earl of Warwick and Richard's brother George betrayed the king temporarily seizing control of him and his government. However, both soon realised that there was a lack of support for either man to rule. Edward was released and reinstated as king in September of that year. Richard remained loyal and as a reward was appointed by Edward as his figurehead in Wales, the real ruling being undertook by others. The following year, Warwick and George rebelled again, this time successfully restoring Henry VI to the throne. Edward IV and Richard were forced to seek refuge, returning again to the Low Countries. However, Edward IV would return to England in 1471, with Richard accompanying him on the victorious campaign. Triumphs at the Battle of Barnet and Tewkesbury ended the conquest. 
Richard demonstrated his power as a warrior and commander, but also his ruthlessness, where as constable, he summarily condemned the Lancastrian leaders to death. Before Richard's ascension as king in 1483, he spent a dozen years as a great nobleman. Although this experience was useful training for kingship, it was not intended as such, for Richard cannot have expected to accede to the throne. Instead, he built a future for the dynasty that he was intent on founding. Richard appeared at court, as well as at the chapters of the Order of the Garter, in Parliament and Royal Council, and in major ceremonial occasions. He led the largest company in his brother Edward's invasion into France, to which they successfully negotiated with France to concede paying 75,000 crowns with an annual pension of 50,000 crowns. During his time as part of the nobility, Richard would marry Anne Neville, the daughter of the now deceased Earl of Warwick and widow of Edward of Lancaster. It is not believed to have been a marriage of love, but more about the three royal brothers, Edward, George and Richard, colluding in depriving the Countess of Warwick of her entitlements. By 1478, rumours began to spread wildly that George was inciting rebellion among the people and leading a revolt against Edward. Subsequently, George was captured and executed at the Tower of London on the 18th of February 1478. Although Richard made himself more dominant than the king had originally intended, Edward accepted the hegemony once it had been established. His self-advancement was crowned by the Scottish War of 1481-83, when he was appointed the King's Lieutenant in the North, recapturing Berwick and briefly occupying Edinburgh. In 1483, Parliament thanked him, granted him Cumberland as County Palatine, made him hereditary warden of the Western Marches and authorised him to keep whatever Scottish territory he could conquer. A great future on the borders apparently beckoned, but he became King of England instead. The Usurping of King Edward V On the 9th of April 1483, Edward IV died, leaving his 12-year-old son, Edward V, to succeed him. Richard immediately took charge of his nephew. During this time, it seemed that Richard already had ambitions of securing power for himself. Upon escorting the king from Stony Stratford on May the 1st, he ordered that Earl Rivers, the queen's brother, and Lord Richard Grey, Edward's half-brother, into custody and executed them for treason in what is believed to eliminate any competent influence. Richard escorted the young king to London and was recognised by the Royal Council as Lord Protector. Henceforth, he was head of government. The Queen, her daughters and Edward's younger brother, also called Richard, took refuge in Westminster Abbey. Most people's fears were allayed by Richard's respectfulness to the King and by his continued preparations for the coronation. However, shortly after this, Richard would again make a power play, having Lord Hastings arrested and executed for what many people believed were fabricated claims of treason to remove Edward's most devoted supporter. On June 16th, he secured possession of the younger Richard on the pretext of ensuring that the boy would attend Edward's coronation. With both princes in his power, Richard postponed the coronation. Events then moved rapidly. Richard's claim to the throne was publicised in London on 22nd of June. It was asserted not only that Edward IV was illegitimate, but also that his sons were illegitimate on the grounds that Edward had a pre-contract of marriage to another woman before he wed Elizabeth Woodville. Edward V and his younger brother Richard were housed in the royal apartments at the Tower of London, but were never seen again. The absorption was backed by the Northern Army, which overawed London from its camp at Finsbury Fields. King Richard III and Queen Anne were crowned at Westminster Abbey on the 6th of July, 1483. King Richard III of England Richard III's reign was short, lasting just over two years. Opposition to Richard's rule grew, coalescing around Henry Tudor, the last Lancastrian claimant to the throne, then exiled in France. By 1484, the king was increasingly reliant on a small group of associates and the threat of insurrection overshadowed his reign. His position was gravely weakened by the deaths of his only son, Prince Edward, in 1484, and his queen in 1485. There was some good sense in the notion of a marriage to Elizabeth of York, his niece, and Edward IV's daughter, who could have strengthened his title, would no longer have been available to marry Henry Tudor, and could have borne him sons anew. This plan, however, if it ever was a plan, was vetoed by his supporters and was highly unpopular. Richard's support may have been diminished by highly effective propaganda presenting him as the murderer, like King Herod, of innocent babes, a betrayer like Judas Iscariot, a tyrant and a committer of incest with his niece. 
Rumours of unrest and rebellion continued to spread in the early stages of 1485. Tales of invasion by a Tudor army became something that everyone expected. Finally, Henry Tudor's invading army landed at Mill Bay near Dale, Pembrokeshire. The army was made up of French and Scottish mercenaries and exiles. Upon their arrival, they marched toward England, accompanied by his uncle Jasper and John de Vere, the 13th Earl of Oxford. Henry gained support and soldiers from the Welsh during the march. This was thought to be because he was descended from the Welsh Lord, Rhys ap Griffith. Although London was Henry's goal, he would not march straight to the city. Instead, he headed eastward to pick up Sir Gilbert Talbot and other English allies. After a short stay in Shrewsbury to rest his men, Henry would begin marching for London. Since the 22nd of June, Richard had been aware of Henry's impending invasion and had ordered his lords to maintain a high level of readiness. News of Henry's landing reached Richard on the 11th of August, but it took three to four days for his messengers to notify his lords of the king's mobilisation. On the 16th of August, the Yorkist army started to gather. With Richard riding in haste to Nottingham, the Duke of Norfolk set off for Leicester, the assembly point that night. Simultaneously, the Earl of Northumberland, whose northern territory was the most distant from the capital, had gathered his men and ridden to Leicester. On the 20th of August, Richard rode from Nottingham to Leicester, joining Norfolk. He spent the night at the Blue Boar Inn. Northumberland arrived the following day. The Royal Army proceeded westward to intercept Henry's march on London. Passing Sutton Cheney, Richard moved his army towards Ambien Hill, just south of the modern-day Market Bosworth, which he thought would be of tactical value, and made camp on it. The Battle of Bosworth On the 22nd of August 1485, the Battle of Bosworth ensued. The invading army, led by Henry Tudor, Lancastrian claimant to the throne, and estimated to be 5,000 to 8,000 men, made up of French mercenaries, Scottish exiles, Welsh recruits, Richard's deserters, and a force of English warriors from the border counties. Although Henry would lead the army, it would also be commanded by Sir Gilbert Talbot, Captain Bernard Stuart, the 4th Lord of Albany, John de Vere, the 13th Earl of Oxford, and Henry's uncle, Jasper Tudor, 1st Duke of Bedford. The English army was led by King Richard III of England, Yorkist claimant to the throne, and estimated to be 7,500 to 12,500 men. The Duke of North Norfolk's force of spearmen stood on the right flank, protecting the cannon and about 1,200 archers. The King's group, comprising of 3,000 infantry, formed the centre. The Earl of Northumberland's men guarded the left flank. He had approximately 4,000 men, many of them which were mounted. Standing on the hilltop, Richard had a wide, unobstructed view of the area. He could see Sir William Stanley and their 4,000 to 6,000 men holding positions on and around Dadlington Hill, while to the southwest was Henry's army. It is reported that prior to the battle, Richard, worried about the support of Sir William Stanley, sent a messenger to him demanding that he attack Henry's forces immediately, otherwise he would execute his son. Sir William simply replied that he had other sons, and Richard, incensed at the response, ordered his son to be executed. However, his men convinced their liege that it would be better to do it after the battle. This may have been a sign of things to come for Richard. Astutely aware of his own military inexperience, Henry gave command of his army to John de Vere, who upon seeing the long line of Richard's men at the top of Ambien Hill, ordered his men to keep together and stray no further than 10 feet from the bannermen. This resulted in individual groups clumped together which were flanked by cavalry to minimise the opportunity for the troops to be overwhelmed should Richard's men charge down the hill. The Lancastrians were harassed by Richard's cannon as they manoeuvred around the marsh, seeking firmer ground. Once Oxford and his men were clear of the marsh, Norfolk's battalion and several contingents of Richard's group under the command of Sir Robert Brackenbury started to advance. Hails of arrows showered both sides. Henry's men proved the steadier in the ensuing hand-to-hand -hand combat. They held their ground and several of Richard's men fled the field. Recognising that his force was at a disadvantage, Richard signalled for Northumberland to assist, but Northumberland's group showed no signs of movement. At this point in the battle, it is believed that Richard saw Henry at some distance behind his soldiers. Seeing this opening, Richard decided that he wanted to end the fight early and led a mounted charge around the outside of the main fighting force and began decimating Henry's troops. After the battle, Henry's men told how the charge caught them by surprise and that Henry did not wish to battle, dismounting his horse and hiding between the men in order to conceal himself. The Earl of Oxford had left a small reserve of pike-equipped men with Henry. They slowed the peace of Richard's mounted charge and brought Tudor some critical time. The remainder of Henry's bodyguards surrounded their master and succeeded in keeping him away from the Yorkist king. It was at this point the tide turned in Henry's favour. 
Seeing Henry's men separated from the main fighting contingent, Sir William Stanley charged, attacking Richard's men and tearing them apart. Richard's force was driven several hundred yards away from Tudor, near to the edge of a marsh into which the king's horse toppled. Richard, now unhorsed, gathered himself and rallied his dwindling followers, supposedly refusing to retreat. According to the historians Michael Jones and Philippa Langley, he pronounced, God forbid that I retreat one step. I will either win the battle as a king or die as one. Polydor Virgil, Henry Tudor's official historian, recorded that King Richard alone was killed fighting manfully in the thickest press of his enemies. Richard had come within a sword's length of Henry Tudor before being surrounded by William Stanley's men and killed. The Burgundian chronicler Jean Molinet says that the Welshman struck the death blow with a halberd while Richard's horse was stuck in the marshy ground. It was said that the blows were so violent that the king's helmet was driven into his skull. The contemporary Welsh poet Guthori Glyn implies that leading Welsh Lancastrian Rhys Ap Thomas, or one of his men, killed the king, writing that he killed the boar, shaved his head. Analysis of King Richard's skeletal remains found 11 wounds, nine of them to the head. A blade consistent with a halberd had sliced off part of the rear of Richard's skull, suggesting he had lost his helmet. Richard's forces were routed as news of his death spread across the battlefield. The Earl of Northumberland and his men fled north on seeing the king's fate, and the Duke of Norfolk was killed by the knight Sir John Savage in single combat, according to the Ballad of Lady Bessie. Richard III would be the last English monarch killed on the battlefield. His death would conclude the War of the Roses and mark the end of the Middle Ages in England. Discovery of Richard's Body Since Richard III's death, Many legends had arisen concerning the fate of his body. The best known of these was published by the cartographer and antiquary John Speed in 1611. Speed wrote, His body was borne out of the city and contemporaneously bestowed under the end of Bow Bridge, which giveth passage over a branch of the saw upon the west side of the town. It was also thought that during the destruction of the friary, Richard's body was dug up and paraded through the streets of Leicester by a jeering mob before finally being cast into the river saw off Bowbridge. The legend grew with every telling and was particularly popular in the Victorian period. In 1856, a local builder, Benjamin Broadbent, erected a memorial plaque next to the bridge, which still survives to this day. On the 24th of August 2012, the University of Leicester and Leicester City Council, in association with the Richard III Society, announced that they had joined forces to begin a search for the remains of King Richard. Experts set out to locate the lost site of the former Greyfriars Church, demolished during Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries, and to discover whether his body had been buried there. By comparing fixed points between maps in an historical sequence, the search located the church, where Richard's body had been hastily buried without pomp in 1485, its foundations identifiable beneath a modern-day city centre car park. On the 12th of September 2012, it was announced that the skeleton discovered during the search might be that of Richard III. Several reasons were given. The body was of an adult male, it was buried beneath the choir of the church, and there was a severe scoliosis of the spine, possibly making one shoulder higher than the other, to what extent depended on the severity of the condition. On the 4th of February 2013, the University of Leicester confirmed the skeleton was beyond reasonable doubt that King Richard III. This conclusion was based on mitochondrial DNA evidence, soil analysis and dental tests, as well as physical characteristics of the skeleton which are highly consistent with contemporary accounts of Richard's appearance. Following the discovery of Richard's remains in 2012, it was decided that they should be reburied at Leicester Cathedral, despite feelings in some quarters that he should have been reburied in York Minster. His remains were carried in procession to the cathedral on the 22nd of March 2015 and reburied on the 26th of March 2015, at which both Tim Stevens, the Bishop of Leicester, and Justin Webley, the Archbishop of Canterbury, officiated. The British royal family was represented by the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. The actor, Benedict Cumberbatch, who later portrayed him in The Hollow Crown, read a poem by Poet Laureate Carol Ann Duffy. Josh here. Dave and I really enjoyed researching this video, especially since some of it occurred in our lifetime. As someone who was born and raised in Leicestershire, I find the discovery of Richard III fascinating. I hope you enjoyed the video. Liking and subscribing helps us out massively. Thank you all for watching.